everybody to today's interview we are conducting in the frame of our CZ Talk series. CZ Talk is a set of interviews or consists of a set of interviews which aims at raising awareness of our members and the workers in the European Union for the upcoming European elections, but also, of course, to analyze uh, the deeds and the activities, the initiatives of our EU level with all its benefits and flaws. And I'm very, very happy to have with me today member of the European Parliament, Peter, Dr. Peter Liese. Dr. Liese is a doctor indeed, and he is member of uh, the group of uh, the European People's Party, member among others of the so-called ENVY Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and also member of the Subcommittee in Public Health. And he is also the coordinator of the EPP in the ENVY uh, Committee. Dr. Liese, welcome. Welcome. You have been um, extremely visible in the media in these past uh, weeks and months and years, and it was quite impressive also what the parliament recently adopted, also the different files and legislation. Uh, my question is, because we're representing also many workers from the public administrations, also at local, local and regional level, how can local governments basically contribute to the green transitions? How can they be supported also by the European Union in doing that? Yeah, in fact, uh, two weeks ago, the European Parliament did a huge step. We adopted the biggest climate law ever, that is uh, European emission trading. It will help us to bring our climate targets at the lowest possible cost. So the emission reduction is always done in that place where it is most cost efficient because this challenge is so huge, we should do it at the lowest possible cost. Um, how can the administration help? I think um, to have these targets and to have uh, an incentive in form of a market-based mission, emission trading, uh, market-based measure is good, but we also need to enable people to do what is necessary. And here uh, the local uh, governments and municipalities have a, a big role to play. We need, for example, renewable energy, and it takes a lot of time uh, for the permitting. I think politicians have the responsibility to prioritize and tell the um, people in the administration how to prioritize this process. But I would also encourage everybody to look at the transition in a positive way and um, tell us where are the obstacles, what we should do. We, we have um, a proposal of the European Commission also called Net Zero Industrial Act, where we prioritize things that are necessary for the transition to net zero. My group thought it could have been earlier. You know, we are a bit late, uh, four years after starting the Green Deal, now speaking also about the administrative burden and uh, the way to permitting. But it's better late than never. And uh, I would be really grateful if representatives from local regional authorities tell us where is the biggest potential to speed it up. Uh, Dr. Lisi, you mentioned the Net Zero Industry Act and uh, there has been a lot of talks also of, uh, about the US Inflation Reduction um, Act. We had different uh, also uh, exchange with the European Commission. One of our issues is of course, as we represent also um, public uh, private sector actors and workers, what role do you believe should the, the private sector play in this green transition? And here also, again, my question, how can the EU incentivize companies to prioritize uh, sustainability and environmental responsibility? Yeah, the emission trading system was a, a big step and everybody who decarbonizes will be uh, better off. Uh, if you do not, you will have a hard time. That's, that's a very clear signal via the price. I also think we need to focus our legislation. So there are, of course, many other things, emissions from, from other pollutants than CO2 um, and uh, 
plant protection and issues like that. But if we want to do this transition, we need to make a priority here and not try to regulate everything at the same time. Because my conviction, at least, is the climate crisis is the most urgent. Some other issues, we made already big progress. For example, on uh, air pollution, we have reduced NOx and um, particular matter to one third. Uh, so it's much better than in the 90s. And if we wait one or two more years for the next legislation that will make it easier for those that have to deal with it in the private sector, uh, uh, there are sometimes only one or two people in a factory that knows how to implement all this legislation. And when they focus on decarbonization, we cannot overburden them with uh, other things. So, and when you speak about the um, United States, uh, the development, it's rather uh, America first. That's a big problem. And we need to challenge the Americans again and again that green transition will not work if you focus only on your own market. We need a global market for this. Europe's answer shouldn't be Europe first. Europe's answer should be Europe fast. And uh, as I said, those that are trying to do the transition, for example, those that are responsible for decarbonizing a steel plant, they have uh, a lot of obstacles and they can't do it fast. But the climate will ask us to do it fast and international comp competition, including with the United States and China, will also ask us to, to go fast so that we are first movers and get the first movers advantage. We have also members, for instance, in, in uh, the automotive sectors who are, how could I say, a little bit afraid or worried that uh, uh, the, the pace you, you just mentioned, you just mentioned we have to be fast, might be too fast. Next year, there will be the European elections and how important will be the green agenda, but also, of course, the social agenda. What what are you, let's say, main hopes or worries for the upcoming European elections? Yeah, first of all, on the automotive industry, I, I understand uh, the concerns. And personally, I voted four times, two times in committee, two times in plenary against the ban of the combustion engine. So I don't think it's the right way. The emission trading, as I said, will always bring uh, the emission reduction where it is uh, the easiest and the low cost. And for the moment, people say e-fuels are expensive, but I don't know how expensive e-fuels are in 35 or in 40. And maybe they are used uh, as an emergency when you have an electric vehicle, but you still have a very small combustion engine for emergency cases. And uh, why, why to ban this? So I, I, uh, we will have more electric vehicles. I'm all in favor, but we shouldn't uh, make it um, too prescriptive. We should be technologically open. For the European elections, you know, um, it will be a challenge. We have a lot of far right and far left parties. Um, I think we need to get out with a clear message. We have different ideas also in the center of the European Parliament. I don't agree with everything that my social democrat counterparts say. Um, and we have a competition on the best ideas for Europe, but we agree that the far left and the far right, they don't have the answer. And the European Parliament makes concrete decisions. Would there be a little bit more colleagues uh, against the ban of combustion engine, we wouldn't have it. It was a tiny majority for this ban. So everybody's vote makes a difference and that's important. So you cannot go and vote for the far right and far left because you think it doesn't matter. It matters a lot and we make decisions. And if you don't like them, vote for those that show another way in this concrete example you may find uh, millions of other examples. So this election is more important than ever. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Let me just add that for us, uh, the European Parliament, I mean, looking back also at the, at the difficult uh, December, January, and, and the so-called Qatar gate has been always very open and welcoming. And uh, from, from our side here, 
uh, we can only wish you um, all the best for the coming year and for the upcoming European elections. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.